Okay. So for the writing test, we are working on the task two, which is the essay writing. You know, essay writing has a chunk of the mark of score from the writing test, right? Um, essay writing would give you about 66.69% of the total score you get from writing test. Then task one would give you 33.31%. So overall, out of the 100% you're getting, these are the allotments. So this guy is having more than twice what this guy gives you. So you pay more attention to it. It's not like you're going to ignore this guy. Of course, you are going to accord this guy its own effort. But this is where you get a chunk of the marks, right? So there is the need to try as much as possible to have a great level of understanding and how it how it's supposed to be structured, the delivery, the kind of words you should bring in, how to interpret questions and be on the right track and all that. Then how to also work on your speed. You need to work on your speed because in IELTS tests, the time runs faster than normal. So if you don't work with the pace that is necessary for you to achieve what you need, you end up being going halfway and the time elapses, right? Okay, so um, Francis, in the next five or 10 minutes, um, I'll take us through what we had yesterday so that the physical clients here will also be at the same page and then we proceed to where we stopped yesterday, okay? All right, so the essay writing, um, you are required to have a minimum of 250 words. 250 words minimum. Please don't write less. Make sure you attain up to or more. In essay writing, there are some things you should avoid and certain things you should not fail to bring in. So that's what we call the pros and cons. Some of the things you should avoid basically is one, avoid repetitions. You must try to avoid repetitions in your essay writing. So when you make use of a word in a, in a sentence, if you want to repeat that same word in the next sentence, you are advised strongly to make use of the synonym of that word. Don't repeat that same word in the second sentence. Please, let do this conscientiously. Let's just do it intentionally. That when a word appears in my first sentence, in my second sentence, I shouldn't use that word. I should use the synonym of that word. And when I say that I expect you to avoid repetition, it doesn't, it's not, it has nothing to do with root words that you can't do without. There are root words in every sentence that you cannot do without. To, is, a, v. Those words, you cannot avoid them. And there is no way you can avoid repeating them. Right? But we are talking about key words, major words, that vocabularies. So if you are making use of a particular vocabulary and you want to repeat it in the next sentence, I have to say, use the synonym of that vocabulary instead of repeating the same word. Please, do you understand? Okay. So avoid repetition. The second word says... Avoid the use of acronyms unless or except when you have established the full meaning in the previous sentence. Acronyms. Do you remember what acronyms are? Do you know what acronyms are? Like IELTS is an acronym, right? So if you must use IELTS in a sentence, it is expected that you ought to have written the full meaning of IELTS in a previous sentence. So when you now write IELTS, the examiner would relate it to the full meaning. Is that correct? Is that okay? Now you also should avoid the use of informal words and expressions. The use of informal words and expressions. And some of the informal words we are going to talk about right now very quickly would be the use of the word help. 
help. Why should you avoid help? Because you use it when you are having a casual expression with someone you have good rapport with, right? But you know, essay writing is an, is a formal writing. So you are meant to use formal expressions and technologies and words, right? So instead of saying help, what should you use? Assist or support or aid, right? Then you are also advised to avoid the use of the word very, very. Because IELTS feels rather than saying very, because when you use the word very, you must also add a particular word that you are trying to describe or emphasize using that very, right? Because when you use the word very, you are trying to emphasize on something. I'm hungry is normal. But I'm very hungry. You are expressing the extent, right, of the hunger. So I have feels rather than using very hungry, that you can use a particular word, just one word, that covers very and hungry. For instance, I'm famished. I'm famished means you are very hungry, right? I'm starving means you are very hungry, right? Um, you are saying. The lady is very beautiful. You're making emphasis. I am says, why don't you say the lady is gorgeous? Right? She's, she's angelic, as some people will say. Right? I am says, instead of saying, I'm very tired, why don't you say, I'm exhausted? Right? So, avoid the use of the word very. Okay? I hope you are looking at yes. all right now let's also look at other words you should avoid avoid abbreviations abbreviations so every word you have to spell has to be written in full don't write any word in its short or shortened form express every word in its full state all right avoid the use of certain expressions such as kids. Kids. If you use kids, you are referring to baby goats in essay writing because kids is a formal word for baby goats. If you are using it to refer to children, that's an informal expression, it drops your mark. Remember, a particular um, cons here says avoid informal expression. So when you use kids to refer to children, you are making an informal expression. Do you understand? So you only make use of kids when you are referring to baby goats. Huh? Like I always advise people, avoid calling your, your children kids. When they start behaving like baby goats, don't be surprised. Because they are the one that is bringing that attribute to them. Because normally when you look at a young girl and you keep calling her princess, princess every time, princess, uh, when she grows up, she'll start forming like a princess, keeping her hands like chicken that wants to fly. You know? So, you need to address people the way you want them to behave or you want them to look at themselves first. Then you should also avoid the use of the word word, word, W-A-R-D, or words. Avoid it. It's an informal word for children. Some people use this to refer to children, right? In your school, you use that when you're writing letters. No. Dear parents, kindly know that your child or your ward is to dress in so and so on a cultural day. No, no, no. You now use Lenas. Okay, use Lenas now. Uh -huh. So, some people use this guy to refer to children. So, this guy is informal. Please avoid this guy. This guy is also ambiguous. It has multiple meanings. It can be addressed in the hospital. It can be used in a prison. It can be used as local governments. You have World 1, you have Elevishi World 2, you have Canada World 3, <laughs> all that. So avoid this guy. Also avoid infants. Infants. Some people argue that infants is a formal expression for children. Arguably, it may be considered. But I tell you generally, infant is a formal word for baby ape and baby monkey. Mm? Yes. And it's also a, a terminology 
for younger rec recruits in the military, infants. Then also avoid the use of the word offsprings. It's used informally to refer to children, but it's ambiguous. In offsprings can be of plants, of animals, then informally for humans. So avoid this guy. Any word you want to use for children should be children. Don't paraphrase it. Don't substitute it for any other word. Also, you should avoid the use of M-U-M, M-O-M. This is a short, excuse me, a short form for what? Gina, please help me with water. This is a short form for what? Mommy. Mommy. Right? Now, both mom, M-U-M, or mom, M-O-M, and M-U-M-M-Y, and M-O-M-M-Y, both, thank you, both can be considered to be informal, both of them. So you need to avoid them. You need to avoid them. One, this is a casual expression to your mom because you have this intimacy, right? Intimate relationship with your mom. So, hi mom, ah, mom, you know, all of that. Then, mommy, mommy, that's another expression. But the formal expression is what? Mother. So you are expected to use mother instead of mom or mommy. And then this guy also means something else. Besides the short form of mommy, it also means to be quiet, to be silent, to be mom. Right? That's, what, that's another meaning of it. So you should avoid it when you write it. Right? Then you are also expected to avoid ambiguous words. Ambiguous words. What are Mr. Rocket, what ambiguous words? Please give us the mic. example of an ambiguous word. Okay. So put on not to do at school. I just deleted one word there now from there. <laughs> I tell us mom means two things, right? Okay. Both the informal word for mommy and also it means to be silent. So it means words. And we said it could be hospital, prison, it could be the local government. I deleted um what else? They have different meanings, right? Those are ambiguous words. If you also look at this guy, what does this word? How do you pronounce it? Lead. Lead. Is it ambiguous? Okay, teach us. Because, the same. because what? Follow means the same word. Follow, no, that's not what I mean. You are talking about synonym now. I'm talking about... Does it have multiple meaning? Does it have a different meaning from yes, leave? Okay, what does it mean? Uh, what what meanings do you know? Uh, should I say proceed? Proceed, no. Mm -hmm. 
still on the east. <laughs> Okay, you are giving us. You see, they can also be referred to as a chemical. What chemical is that? I'm not good in sciences, but I know it's from the science. Thank you. This word means lead, right? Means to to take charge of a particular team, right? Yes. To be in charge of a particular team. That's that guiding or directing them or what to do. Is that correct, Francis? It also means a substance that is used to produce pens. Oh. oh. Right? That substance is also called lead. Is that correct? Now, let us... Now, look at this. The process of lead is lead. Is the word lead ambiguous? It's not a substance. Huh? Mm -hmm. Substance that follow this, the present I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's come to meeting. Lead. Right? Do you think it's an ambiguous word? It's a very straightforward word, right? Very yes. final answer. Yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Francis, do you, do you think? I think so, but I'm trying to figure out what else it might out. mean. Yeah, what well, it can be, yeah. Okay. I, I think it's it. Yes. Lead, or oh, sorry, lead is the past form of taking charge, right? Or giving guidance over or to a group of persons. Bob. Yes. No, right? Yes. A, a type of yes. light bulb. Yes. Oh, oh, yes. <laughs> Do we understand this? Look at this word too. Is it ambiguous? To read. To read. Yes. Um, I can't even really remember the second one. Nitik is racking her head. Let's hear. <laughs> Do you think it's ambiguous? You read. It's just to read. Final answer. <laughs> All right, Francis. Do you think the word read is ambiguous? Are you a Catholic? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just trying to wrap my head. All right. No, don't go towards that direction. Read present present tense. Read present same spelling. Mm -hmm. It means to read now. It means you are read in the past. The same word. Giving you two scenarios. The same spelling. Past tense of read. This is read. You have to read. You have to read, right? This is spelling. I have read. Still the same spelling. How about light? Hmm? The word light. Light. L-I-G-H-T. To have light. Illumi illumination yeah, and to be wait, to be exactly. So these are ambiguous words. Do you understand this? So you need to really know what a word stands for. Sometimes Ambiguous words often have nouns and verbs. So a, a word may be an actual word and at the same time name of a particular thing. Please, you understand this? So you need to al always ask yourself, um, is this a verb, is this an actual word, or is it the name of a thing? If it stands for the two, then it is ambiguous. Right? 
So I have says avoid ambiguous words. Now you also are expected to avoid overly or commonly used words and expressions. Avoid overly used or commonly used words and expressions. During your writing. So avoid it. What do you do then? I also say is use more of advanced words and expressions. That's another pro. Something you should do. Deploy or make use of advanced words or expressions. Then you should avoid this guy. Avoid the use of charging words because you feel IELTS says give us advanced words, give us advanced words, and you you went home and copied all those honorable Patrick's English. I want you them to write IELTS. Um, you are asked to talk about your topic in essays talking about government, and you are saying due to some political brouhaha that has caused some crinkle crankle leading to political. <coughs> You'll be the one to match your script by yourself. Alright? So, don't go for tragic words. I have says, give us words that are advanced but very precise in the context you are writing. Okay? Then, do not do short hands. This one again. Do not write short hands in essay. You know what short hands are? No, short hands. Check your notes. Do you have them? Yes, yeah. definitely. I definitely. I saw that the other time. So all those short hands, people writing letter U instead of Y O U. People writing number four. Instead of F O R and the likes, I have says avoid this guy. Do all your writing in full. Okay, there are some keys you should hold on to when you are writing. There are certain keys you should not forget to apply when you are writing. We call them, they fall under advanced expressions. So these keys can be divided into three. The first is the linking words. And we also have the sequencers. We have the idioms. Okay, so let's look at these keys that can help you to achieve advanced expressions. Uh, give, the, give the mic to Francis. All right, um, you're going to take us through these three areas based on what you learned yesterday. Those words you bring in when you want to join two sentences or three sentences or ideas together as one sentence. Right? Linking words are those words that we use to join or connect two or more independent ideas or sentences together to become one. Right? Okay, so please, Francis, go ahead. What are some of the examples of linking words? Okay, please. Uh, you, if you're a teacher, your, your students will fail. Take. Let me give it gradually. 
All right, so the first one he said, however, thank you. Whereas, meanwhile, meanwhile, although, although, also, we have contrary, contrary, contrarily, yeah, contrary, yeah, contrary. On the other hand, on the other hand, on the other hand, is that taken? Mm -hmm. Etc. Right? It is. No. Or make a sentence. Rather than putting your full stop, you bring in comma. You have exhausted this idea right here. So, but you are not making it a complete sentence yet. You want to have a more compound. Then you bring in a linking word. Alright? After that linking word, another comma comes in before you continue with the next idea you want to join. Please, do you understand? That is how to apply the linking word. Now let's go to sequencers. Okay. Sequencers. Thank you. That means we are taking note. Sequencers. Sequencers are words or phrases that are that are words or phrases that are used to either begin a paragraph or a fresh sentence. For a sentence, or introduce an additional idea in a paragraph. Or phrases that are used to either begin a paragraph or introduce an additional idea in a paragraph. Please, do we understand this? Can you give us examples of sequencers? Okay, examples. First and foremost, that's first example. First and foremost. First and foremost. Okay? You can also say furthermore. 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 Additional. Subsequently. 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 None, none the less. None the less. None the less. No, the session ended. So we are continuing. You, the last um, example of sequencer that you gave us. Okay, we have uh, notwithstanding. Notwithstanding. We have contrary again. Contrarily. Contrarily. That's 
conclusively, conclusively, summarily or summarily. Yes, please. Okay. Then we have, no, but not least, we have in light of the above. In light of the above. That's the last example yeah. of sequencer. The in light of the above. Also have consequently. All right. Yes, that's consequently now. In light of the above. Now, thank you so much, Francis. Now, let's understand. It's not about introducing, not about dropping sequencers anywhere in your essay just to make relevance. It's about using the right sequencer in the right scenario. Right? So you need to understand the difference or the essence of each of the role or the ap application of each of those words. Let's begin. When do you use first and foremost? When can we use first and foremost in a paragraph? At the beginning. At the beginning. Right? Do you agree with her? When do we use furthermore in a paragraph? To continue what you are establishing or trying to write. When do we use furthermore, Francis? When can we use furthermore? When we want to introduce another sentence. When you want to add something to what you have. Now, let's understand another thing. When can we use the expression consequently? When do we say consequently? I mean, we are trying to talk about the negativity of we are trying to we are not agreeing bring it out the consequence of the story. Okay, it's, it's shaky. It's shaky. Let's hear Do you have an idea where we can use the word consequently? Okay. the resultant effect of something of what you have established the resultant effect they were actually having a particular lifestyle or they were engaging in a particular activity then as a result of that it led to something so instead of saying as a result of this it led to you know say consequently do you understand Okay, uh, did you get the explanation of consequently? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so let me... Can you hold the moment? Yes, yes. Sudden moment. In a sudden moment, on what basis, on what situation? Like, uh, saying something like, we are, we are all happy together. We're all happy together suddenly. Okay, suddenly. Okay. Yes, that's better. Talk about an effect or occurrence. Okay, but can it also come inside the sequence? No, no, no. It, it shouldn't. Yes, it, it's used to express um, a level of reaction or the emergence of something that happened unexpectedly right okay, mm. okay. so we, uh, we've understood how to apply consequently right now when do we let's ask Miti. when do we use the word contrarily no idea right okay it's not okay when can we say contrary that is uh, contradicting or uh, When you are what? Expressing something that is contradicting an idea you've written before. Yeah. 
Francis, do you agree with that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I think, yeah. Contrarily, is when you want to begin an experience to, to contradict, to oppose um, the previous information you have given. Do you understand this? All right. Now, where can we use the word summarily? Summary, summarily. At the end of your. When you are writing your conclusion, you you wrap your essay wrap up with summarily. Now, I have says, do not say in summary, do not say in conclusion. Do not... I don't know how else. Eh? No. <laughs> However, you want to express it, I also says they are common. Remember, one of the rules here says avoid commonly or overly used expressions, right? So instead of using the commonly used expressions such as to wrap up, to round up, use just one word, summarily. It's advanced. Use one word conclusively, it's advanced. Right? Then, depending on the situation of your essay, you may also use in light of the above to So that's it. Let's move on to idioms. Idioms. Um, Francis, I will not ask you. You had the idea yesterday. Let's ask Ms. Fulake. Please, what do you understand to be, or what? how can you explain or define idioms? What are idioms? Idioms are words that have a deeper meaning than the deeper meaning that's given to us. That's that. The deeper meaning that. Forward, given, the word and the verb, the person and the person. Thank you. Let's. Uh, do you understand? Is this what you Okay, first. She is not hitting it the way I want to hear it. And she's in very much in line. Francis, what are idioms? I think she's so, so good that she's explained the real world. It's the word that doesn't seem, or that, that doesn't come as what it seems. That doesn't mean what it seems. Idioms are words or expressions that don't seem, that don't mean what they seem. They have deeper meaning. Right? Thank you. So, we have the words such as she kicked the bucket. Do you know what? When someone said, or when someone said, um, I was here yesterday before she, before she kicked the bucket. What does that mean? I was there with her yesterday before. What does it mean? Please, let's hear her. I was with her yesterday before she kicked the bucket. What does it mean? <laughs> okay. Um, Francis, tell us. I was with her yesterday before she kicked the bucket. What does it mean? I was there yesterday when she died. Before. <laughs> I was there yesterday before she passed away. That's what it means. To keep the bucket does not mean to pass. <laughs> you see? That's why, in as much like I explained to you yesterday, thoughts are of the opinion that idioms are informal expressions. I personally, I think it's not an informal expression. It's a formal expression that is not understandable by everyone, except people with deep language. Please, do you understand this? So if you ask someone who is not well grounded in the language, what does she kick the bucket mean? The person might say, eh, she kicked it, right? But that's not what it means. When someone tells you that she kicked the bucket, it means that Idiomatic expression. Let me ask Mitik another one. She was put in a pregnant put in a family way last year. She was put in a family way last year. What does it mean? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, 
became a bitch, she, she was she was impregnated. Those are expressions that when you hear them, you might, if you are not so grounded in, in English, appear to be. She was put in a family way. The bitch was impregnated. If I ask you or tell you, please, you need Seems nine. What? Please, can you explain to us what a stitch in time seems nine means? And when you plan, you're able to achieve on time, you are able to meet a physical need to food. It means I'm going to use an idiom to respond to it. Francis, are you there? Good, all right. That's fine. When someone says a stitch in time, somehow means make hay while the sun shines. Do you know what that means? Make hay while the sun shines. This is the deep, deeper part of English now. So make hay while the sun shines means do body. Do you understand it? So a stitch in time seems nine. You have to brace up. Right? You have to work hard now that you are still young. At old age, you can't. Right? So, in IELTS, you are advised to make use of idioms in your writing. I'm advising you. But I still feel to play safe, you should try as much as possible when you write an idiomatic expression. Do you understand this? So that the examiner would understand that this bracket is explaining the idiomatic expression. But if you don't know about idioms, don't worry yourself about it. Just go up. Alright, so let's proceed to the last stage before we get into today's business. A listening test. If I'm to give you listening test right now, and I involve Francis, for instance, and Ted, and that listening test keeps playing, and you listen attentively, you listen attentively, and you maybe you hear your answer and you write, and Francis also writes. At the end of the day, if the answer you chose is maybe Canada. And Francis listens and also hears the same nationality. It means your answers. That means in listening test, answers are fixed. If you hear attentively, you will get the right answer. And the other person, no matter where the person is, if the person hears or listens attentively, will also get the same answer. Is that correct? So this means answers in listening test are fixed. A reading test. When I give you the reading test booklet. You read at your own different locations. If you find the correct answer and you find the correct answer and he finds the correct answer, everyone will be having the same answer. Is that correct? This also means that in reading test, the answers are everyone the same question. But you will interpret the question in your own way. Same as hers. And despite your different interpretations, your choice of words to will definitely be different. But you are all solving the same question. Because of these discrepancies, IELTS has yastics. your essays. So they now look all you have written, they look at your critical analysis, press or solve the problem. So with these um, yardsticks, they are able to arrive at a conclusion as regards giving you marks. So the first one is what we call
All right. So these are yardsticks with which examiners evaluate your essays, your various interpretations of an essay question. The first task achievement. What does it mean? Task achievement is a yardstick evaluate whether or not you were able to completely respond to the question or questions asked. Right? Following the standard template. So in essay writing, examiners check if you were able to follow to the questions in the appropriate template. Okay? As we, pro as we progress into this, I will give you a formula that will help you to adjust. Your task cohesion simply entails your ability to show proper your ability to show proper understanding of the question asked. Okay, so when you are treating your essay, you need to show that you actually understood and to understanding, you need to establish coherence. Coherence, that means sticking to the question asked. Sticking to the question asked. You understand this? So and coherence, you maintain the understanding or exhibit the understanding by sticking to the question. You don't need to begin to write off point, right? So you need to maintain what the question requires. So please, let's ask um, Miti. Is there a difference? Is there a difference between deviation, deviation, and digression? <laughs> deviation? And we have this guy, digression. Have you seen these words before? Never. All right, Ms. Malaka, please help us. Is there a difference between deviation and digression? So, so deviation is moving away from the main question being asked. Mm -hmm. Likewise, digression. Okay. We're not going according to the line. All right, Francis, please take us through deviation and digression. What do they mean? Okay. Deviation is when you are moving away. From the point or going out of the track, while the creation is moving away with the intention of coming back to the point. So, in deviation, there is total derail. You, you move away totally, right? So, do you understand? But digression. You are trying to cite more example to buttress what you are saying, but you still go back to the main idea you are talking about. See the difference? So if I'm talking about prisons who have gone to prison, you know, and came out to become president and they did so well, I'll start with Nelson Mandela. I'll begin to talk about Nelson Mandela that was in a prison and came out and became a president and he did so fantastically. And um, he uh, developed his country, South Africa, to become one of the globally recognized countries. And just like Olusegun Obasanjo also was in the prison, I came up similar to this vision, right? So I'm talking about people who. That's digression. Digression. It's not digression. Digression. But when I when I'm talking about um, governors who came into power through proper election, and I begin to talk about who was them. That's total division because there was no such. And or you want to talk about how people um, became rich 
and you are talking about uh, well, first and foremost, uh, I was born in October 2004. Is that the question? Total deviation. You are talking. You you are to stick to the question. So in IELTS, when you are trying to achieve task cohesion and coherence, digression, yes. Please do you understand this. Now let's go to lexical resources. Lexical resources simply to, um, means your vocabularies. Lexical resources, vocabularies. So you need to build vocabularies. And your vocabularies right here should be advanced vocabularies. Remember, you should avoid commonly and overly used words, right? So go for uh, advanced vocabularies. Now, what do you do? to improve on your vocabularies. One, when you find an advanced word, learn its meaning. Look for synonyms of that same word you are building vocabulary. And each time you find a synonym of any word, please try to know how to apply those words both in the written English as well as in the spoken English. Because they are two different things. You can't use your spoken English in essay writing. If you use that, most of them may sound as slams. Right? So please learn the vocabularies, advanced words, be precise. Learn their synonyms. Learn their applications, both in the written and the spoken English. This is right here has to do with, or have to do with um, the the type of sentence structures that you bring in. IELTS says avoid short and simple sentences because they feel and believe that anybody can make such sentences. So they want you to bring in more of advanced sentences. And advanced sentences simply can be considered to be compound and complex sentences. Compound and complex sentences. Now my question is, is this. Are you there? Okay, my question is what do you need to bring in to achieve or construct a compound or complex sentence? What do you bring in? Or what do you use, what do you make use of to have a compound or complex sentence or sentences? Uh, are you asking me? Yes, please, Francis. What do we need or what do you bring in to achieve a compound or complex sentence? I'm not asking for examples. Okay. <laughs> okay, you're not asking for example. No. I'm asking for a a name given to the Sorry, I didn't get that. I think the the sound cut out. I need you to give us I need you to give us the name given to the type of words that can be used or deployed to achieve compound and complex sentences. Okay, you know, you know that you are not What's the name given to the type of words that can be used or deployed to achieve compound and complex sentences. Oh, she said linking words. Francis, do you agree with her? Linking words, okay. Huh? Yes, I agree. Yeah, totally, yes. Okay. Linking words, yeah. That's the name given to those words. You are giving us this one. Okay. All right. So, to achieve nice grammatical range, you please make use of your linking words. Make use of those linking words. 
They will help you to join more ideas together to last longer, and that would constitute compound and complex sentences. Please, is this clear to us? As you make or construct your compound and complex sentences, they need to show great level of accuracy. So when you are talking about situations that happened in the past, and if amidst your past tenses, you also need to consider the subjects. The subjects. If the more than one person, that means you are going to use plural indicators. Is that correct? So you're not using, you can't use singular indicator to refer to many people. So those are the things you are expected to talk about as accuracies. Please, do we have any question on this? Okay. On the board, we have Now, this formula has its basis on P1 So, if I ask you to share with us the formula for writing an essay, please simply tell me P1 What does the P's represent? Paragraphs now, if the P's represent paragraphs, how many paragraphs do you think you are supposed to have in your essay? Francis, how many paragraphs do you think we should have in an essay in IELTS? How many paragraphs formula you have on the board? There are, P, we have P1, P2, P3, and P4. And Mythic has confirmed that the P's represent paragraphs. So I'm asking you right now, how many paragraphs do you think you are supposed to have in your essay? Yeah, for 150 uh, words, I guess. For 250 words minimum, 250. In essay, yes. I think it's, uh, <laughs> it's just like guessing, right? I don't think I can just get it right. I can have as, as maybe like uh, five or six. I don't know if it's possible. Five or six paragraphs. All right, thank you. Nice guess. Uh, Ms. Falake, how many paragraphs do you think we should have? At least three, at most four. Uh, okay, at least three, at most Four. All right, thank you. Um, it took how many paragraphs to take now? Four paragraphs. Thank you. Now, Francis, please listen. Based on this formula, P1, P2, P3, P4, which I've just explained to you that each P represents paragraph. And if this is the formula for writing your essay, it simply means you have to have four paragraphs. Simple. It means you are to have four paragraphs. Please, do you understand? All right. Don't write less than four. And do not write more than four. Just have four paragraphs. Please, do you understand this? Okay. No less. No more. Four paragraphs is standard in IELTS. Now, um, by default, you may consider paragraph one as introduction. The first paragraph is usually considered to be your introduction. Paragraphs two and three are the body paragraphs where you discuss show to convince or establish your position. You have to show all of that in paragraphs 2 and 3. 
they are called the body paragraphs and you should have two body the last paragraph this is called the conclusion paragraph that's where you conclude your essay please do you understand this all right now let's go to paragraph one what should you have in your first paragraph according to this formula you are expected to have three major features or components in your first paragraph. The first is you are to have your thesis, your paraphrase. Then second, you are to have your thesis or background statement. Then lastly, you are to have a stance. These are the three things that you should have in your paragraph one. First, your paraphrase. Second, your thesis or background statement is for like take and else. Yes, then lastly, your stance. What does thesis, what are the paraphrase in your paragraph one? Paraphrase simply means you are expected to copy the question as on the question paper onto your answer sheet as the beginning of your first paragraph. Copying the question from the question paper onto your answer sheet as the beginning of your first paragraph. But you do not copy the question verbatim. Do not copy the question word for word. You are meant to rephrase the question. That's why it's given as paraphrase. So what are you paraphrasing? You are paraphrasing the question. Please, Francis, do you understand this? The first thing you are to begin with, the first thing you are to start, or you are to be, you, the first thing you must do, once you are instructed to start your essay, the first thing you should do is to copy the question that you can find on the question paper onto your answer sheet. But do not copy the question word for word. Ms. Polake, can you hear me? Yes. Please, rephrase the question. Rephrase the question. Right? Now, maybe she can move backward a little bit. Rephrase the question. Now, whatever rephrase or whatever approach you want to take to rephrase the question, you must ensure that you are not importing an idea that is not in the question. You must ensure that you are not omitting key information that are in the question. So paraphrasing means copy the question exactly the way it is, but substitute some keywords using their synonyms in ways that they will still mean the same thing. Francis, is this clear to you? Francis, do you understand? Okay, I said paraphrasing the question. That is, copying the question from the question paper onto your answer sheet should be done in a way that you must not import information or ideas that are not in the original question. Don't bring in what is not there. And do not omit important information when you are paraphrasing. So what are you meant to do therefore? You should bring, copy the question exactly the way it is in the, in the uh, original question paper to your answer sheet. But you, are, you must now substitute the keywords that are in the question using their synonyms. And the synonyms you have to bring in must retain the original meaning as what is in the main question. Can you hear me, Francis? All right, great. So I was explaining that paraphrasing is the first step you must take in essay writing. And this simply requires you to copy the question that you can find on your question paper onto your answer sheet. And when you're copying it, you should ensure that you do not omit 
important information that are in the question. And you must not import things that are not in the question. So you are expected and required to copy that question exactly the way it is. But you shouldn't copy it word for word. You are to change the keywords in the question using their synonyms. And the synonyms you are to use should retain the original information that's in the main question. Do you understand this? All right. Now, after paraphrasing the question, the next thing you are to do would be to plan your thesis or background statement. So how do you plan your thesis or background statement? You need to, after the paraphrase, you need to read the question like twice or three times more. Because before you paraphrase the, uh, any question in IELTS, you must not read the question more than once. Don't read questions more than once. If you read any question more than once, to paraphrase it, you may end up bringing in what you feel about the question during your paraphrase. Because the brain has picked interest. The brain has done some analysis, and then you are thinking in the direction of what you are going to solve. How you are going to respond to the question. So that would affect your paraphrase. So to have a successful and accurate paraphrase, read the question just once. And when you are reading once, what you are doing is to look for the keywords, not to read to understand the question. So read to get or pick the keywords that you are sure you know their synonyms. Don't, in IELTS, you don't have time to start thinking of synonyms during your exam. You don't have that time. But by default, if you have built synonyms beforehand, when you spot a word, you will know. You, the synonym will pop up in your mind quickly. But anyone that is not there, if you like think from now to 100 years, it will not come. Alright? So, you are meant to read the question only once. What? Okay. Read the question only once, and then pick the keywords that you know their synonyms and substitute. After the paraphrase has been successfully done, you now need to go back to the original question and read like twice or thrice. This time around, you now want to read to understand. So when you have read the question like twice or thrice, and you have confirmed that, okay, I think I really understand this question. The question will require you to do something. For instance, you may be required to either agree or disagree. You may be required to either express the extent um, at which or to which you, are, you agree with the, the issue. You may be required to establish or discuss both sides of the question. Do you understand this? You may be required to um, express why people carry out certain actions and you should state what the benefits are. Please, you understand this? So, when you, read, when you have read the question like twice or thrice to understand and you feel, I have better points to agree, for instance, to generate your thesis or background statement, you need to go to your question paper. Below the question, there will be vacant space. So go to your question paper and plan your points. Draft out your points. Scribble your points on the question paper. You need to plan your essay. If you plan your essay, writing it is very fast. But if you don't plan your essay, you are going to be an architect. You would, you would manage to get the first point. Second point, you'll be busy decorating the ceiling when other people are writing. Right? So, but if you plan your essay beforehand, your writing will flow very fast. Francis, are you following? All right. So what do you do? Let's take for instance, if the question says, do you agree or disagree, and you feel you want to agree because you feel you have better points to agree, on the question paper, draft out at least 
two strong points that will show your agreement. Two strong points to support the agreement path. Just like in debate, you take a path. So you generate points to support that path. So that's what happens in IELTS. So if you really want to agree, generate two or three or four points, strong points, and these points should not interrelate. There should be two parallel points, but both points will be, will be in agreement. So each point you draft out on your question paper, you should also attach an example to it. Each point you draft out on your question paper, attach an example to it. Now, after attaching your example to the point you have drafted, the point may, the instruction may require you to indicate your stance. Indicate your stance. So your stance may be your opinion. It may be your view. Your stance may be suggestion. It may be whether the merits outweigh the demerits or whether the advantage outweigh the disadvantage. You will see such instructions on your question paper. So, after planning all of these points on your question paper, you will need to go back to your answer sheet. Now, let me ask to confirm that you are following. Francis, on your answer sheet, if you are going back to the answer sheet after planning your essay on the question paper, going back to the answer sheet, what have you written on the answer sheet already? No, please. You have not written the key points. Ms. Polake? I've written the paraphrase. Thank you. You have paraphrased the question. Francis, don't forget. That is the first thing you do on your answer sheet. Paraphrasing the question. Copying the question in a paraphrased way. It was immediately after the paraphrase that you will now you now need to go to read the question to plan your points. I need to follow this. Follow these steps we are taking. Hmm? First, first, read the question only once to pick the keyword that you know they are synonyms. Then second, paraphrase the question onto your answer sheet. Full stop. Then go back to the original question to read it like twice or thrice. To now have proper understanding. So once you have understood the question, you need to ask yourself, what should I do? What path should I take? If the question says, do you agree or disagree? Give your opinion. If the question says that, you need to determine whether or not you have strong points to agree. Right? So if your points, if you have better points to agree, I said, go and plan your essay on your question paper as rough work. So to plan your essay, you are drafting out two points or three or four points, depending on what you can create at that point in time. So when you draft out two, three or four points on your question paper, each point should come with an example. So once you have drafted the point and attached example to each, you now need to also establish your opinion there on the question paper as rough work. Please, do you understand this? So once you have drafted your points and your opinion, you need to go back to the answer sheet where you paraphrased the question. Now at the point where you ended your paraphrase with a full stop, you should continue your thesis or background statement on the same line after the stop of the paraphrase. So what do you do there? You make your background statement. What is background statement? It is a statement you make in writing that confirms to the examiner what you have planned to do in the essay. Your thesis slash background statement is a statement you make in writing that confirms to the examiner what you have planned to do in the essay. What's the plan? Whether you, you, you have whether you intend to agree or disagree. So, yes, that's what you have planned to do. So, if your points are for agreement, your thesis background statement 
is established or launched using these templates. Any of these templates can apply. You can as well use this guy. These are templates that can be used to introduce your thesis or background statement. Okay, the reflection. So the first template here is, in this essay, in this essay, I will be writing to, in this essay, I will be writing to, then the second template there is, this essay is aimed at, this essay is aimed at, that's the second template. Is it taken? Yeah. Alright, welcome. So, now, at this point, after the paraphrase on your answer sheet, full stop comes in, then this is the statement you, be, you add or continue with. Do you understand this? So, I would say something like, in this essay, I will be writing to absolutely agree the issue raised above. Why am I saying I would agree? Because I have generated points to agree. So if my points are for agreement, my thesis background statement will confirm that in this essay I'll be writing to absolutely agree with the issue raised above. Please, you understand this? Now, your thesis background statement does not end with a full stop, but it ends with semicolon. Semicolon. So, um, Francis, here is your semicolon. You know this mark, right? So that's what you you can use to end your your thesis background statement. In this essay, I will be writing to absolutely agree with the issue raised above. Semicolon. You can as well say this essay is aimed at completely agreeing with the issue raised above, right? Then semi-colon. Is this clear? Then after the thesis background statement, your stance, which of course is the opinion you ought to have written on your question paper, the opinion you must have drafted on your question paper as rough work, you then bring it in. So to join my opinion, after the semicolon, I'll then say, although, comma, in my, maybe in my professional opinion, it could be professional opinion, comma, it could be experiential opinion, Comma, it could be candid opinion. It could be personal opinion. Wherever your opinion is coming from. If it is professional opinion, where is it coming from? In line with your profession. If it is experiential opinion, it's coming from what? Experience. If it is your logical thoughts, your personal idea, it is my or personal opinion. So wherever it's coming from, you now say, although in my experiential opinion, comma, I strongly believe that you now copy the opinion you drafted on your question paper and paste. And that will be the end of your paragraph one. Francis, are you following?
then your paragraphs two and three, as well as your paragraph four. Gina. Gina. The next time you will bring this type of food and you are serving yourself alone, you will not be happy. Okay. Paragraphs 2, 3, and 4 are already solved by the planning you do on your Christian paper as government. Your paragraphs 2, 3, and 4. Meeting? Do you want to go join me? <laughs> you are distracting my class, Gina. Okay, don't worry. So, how does your paragraph 1 solve your essay? Paragraph 1 is the engine house of your essay. It's the blueprint of your essay. How does this work? Remember you started by paraphrasing or copying the question, right? In a paraphrased way, onto your answer sheet. Then, you went further to plan your essay. And during the planning, you drafted the points you wish to use, right? And you attached examples to each. And then you also provided your opinion on the question paper, right? Now, all of that that you did, to solve your paragraph 2, to solve your paragraph 2, the topic sentence, which is TS, topic sentence is the point, the first point you jotted down on your question paper, that first point, will now come in as the topic sentence to paragraph 2. That first point is your topic sentence to paragraph 2. You have a question? Francis, do you understand this? So, when you copy that um, point you drafted on your, on your question paper and write as the beginning of your paragraph 2, that would constitute the topic sentence of paragraph 2. Now, that topic sentence can either be ended with a full stop or with a colon. Please, do you understand this? Your topic sentence, you can end it either with a full stop or with a colon. Now, after the colon or full stop, you then begin to explain that point. You know what you have in mind when you have dra drafted that point. You need to begin to talk about it. Give detailed explanation about that point. That would constitute the body paragraph. Body. Body, body paragraph. BP. Body paragraph. So BP means body paragraph. I know your mind is in the food. Abi? Okay, no more. So, when you explain the topic set, Gina, you are fired. <laughs> so, when you explain that topic in detail, that would be the body paragraph, alright? And after explaining in detail, you then cite your example. You cite your example. Now, that example, of course, remember you drafted an example to each point when you were planning your essay, right? So that example you drafted beside the first point, you can bring it in. That's the example. Do you understand this? Now, the example may be real-life example. It might be a fictional example. IELTS is not concerned about that. But they just want you to drop something that, that um, buttresses what you are exp uh, uh, explaining. Right? Francis, are you following Alright, now that's for paragraph 2. In the paragraph 2 also, if you are so creative and confident enough to have maybe drafted four points, you can merge two points in one. Alright? So your topic sentence will say, write the first point and write the second point together. That will be the topic sentence. Now, when you are giving the explanation, you explain the first part of the points. Full stop. Right? Then, 
Furthermore, sequencer, you now use it to bring in the second point. Please, are you understanding this? Francis, are you following? Correct. So, you can discuss two different points in one paragraph. But remember to use sequencers. That's what matters. Then, you don't bring in two different examples when you discuss two different points in one paragraph. Don't bring in two different examples. Bring in just one example. Please, do you understand this? Just one example. Then your paragraph three. Paragraph three, you now pick the other points. The other points, you pick the other points and use it to begin your third paragraph. Please, I hope you are understanding my explanations. So when you write your topic sentence, you can also end it with either a full stop or a colon, right? Then you begin to give detailed expatiation, right? You need to expatiate your point. So that process would make up your body paragraph. Body paragraph. And after the body paragraph, you would also pick the example that you attached to it and add up to the third paragraph. Please, is this clear too? Now your conclusion. Francis, is it clear to you? Alright. Now your paragraph four, which is your conclusion. What you do basically is you need to confirm how many words you have written between paragraphs one, two, and three. Check how many words. Your target is what? Your target is 250 words. Then you can write more, right? So if you check the number of words, if you have written up to maybe 210, or let's say 240, or you have written 250 already. Here are ways you can conclude your essay. Okay, these are the different templates to conclude your essay. The first is summarily, second is conclusively, then the last one here is the right of the book. Now you can actually use any of these two. If you are using any of these two to conclude your essay, it simply means you have counted the number of words you've written between paragraphs 1 to 2 and it's giving you maybe 190 or maybe 210. It's still running, right? Don't worry, I'll, I'll run up very soon. Okay. So if you have counted the number of words you've written between paragraphs 1, 2, and 3, and it's giving you um, within the range of 190 or 210, it means you still have a, a long way to go to achieve um, 250. So what you do? Make use of summarily or conclusively. Right? If you are using summarily or conclusively, you are bound by the practice to Give the synopsis, the summary of those points you discussed in paragraphs 2 and 3. Let me explain this again. If you want to use the word summarily or conclusively, you must follow what must come next is you bring in the summarized version of or concise or synopsis of those topics you, you discussed in your paragraphs 2 and 3. 
So you need to give a recap of those points. That's what you are meant to bring in before you then talk about your opinion. And the opinion is already established in paragraph one. I hope you can remember that. So if you are using summarily or conclusively, you need to give the, uh, the synopsis of the points discussed in paragraphs two and three before bringing in your opinion. And that's it. But if you feel or you have you, you've counted the words and you you can confirm that you've written way above 240 or up to 240, please don't go, don't use summarily or conclusively. Simply use in light of the above, in light of the above, if you have written up to 240 or 250. Do not use summarily or conclusively to conclude, to round up your essay. Use in light of the above. So when you use in light of the above, you simply go straight to your opinion. And that's all. In light of the above, I therefore recommend that you drop your opinion. The opinion you wrote in your paragraph one, you bring it down. But please, you're not bringing it down the opinion verbatim. You're not bringing it down exactly the way you wrote it. You need to also rephrase it, paraphrase it. Please, do we understand? Do you have any question? Francis, do you have any question? Okay, in your next class, right? Okay. Okay, how to count the words, right? Nice question. How do we count the words? You need to count individually how many words you've written on the first line, how many words you've written on the second line, how many words you've written on the third line? One by one. First, I mean, first, two, first three or four lines only. That's what you have to count. Not the whole paragraph. So check your number of words, maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the first line is eight, second line seven, third line eight. So you take average. Average of the three should be seven, right? Average of the three lines should be should give you seven. So you assume that each line has seven words. So you now count how many lines you wrote in the entire paragraphs. So multiply by how many? By seven. Please, do you understand this? So that will give you the idea of how many words you've written within the first three paragraphs. And that will help you to determine the type of closure you should apply. Please, do you have any questions? Go ahead. Nobody can determine this because we don't know how many words you are you can write per line. Okay. So but if you can write up to seven words per line, that means a paragraph can have about um between eight between eight and ten lines per paragraph. Between eight and ten lines per paragraph. That means if you cover 10 lines per paragraph, three paragraphs will give you 210 words. Is that correct? So your conclusion automatically should fetch you about 40 more words. By the time you use summarily or conclusively. Right? Okay. Yeah, so that's the way to go. Any other question? All right, so 